All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Remind everyone to please mute your telephones, mute your devices. Uh, make sure mine's muted while I'm thinking of it. Uh, all three commissioners are present in the courtroom, and if each would identify, Todd Hyatt is present. Bob Anthony, present. Dana Murphy, present. So there is a quorum present. A notice is appropriate. I'll ask the commission secretary, uh, Kendall, if you'd present today's agendas. Good afternoon, commissioners. The daily orders were processed this morning as walkthroughs. On the 24-hour agenda for Wednesday, June 2nd, 2021, submitted for your approval are PUD 2021-2, final order, PUD 2021-3, final order, PUD 2021-5, final order, PUD 2021-6, final order, PUD 2021-8, final order, PUD 2021-10, final order, PUD 2021-11, final order, PUD 2021-12, final order, PUD 2021-13, final order, PUD 2021-15, final order, PUD 2021-16, final order, PUD 2021-17, final order, PUD 2021-71, final order, PUD 2021-75, final order, and PUD 2021-78, final order. Thank you, Kendall. Are there questions or comments on any of the 24-hour agenda items? Seeing none, Kendall, would you please call the roll on the 24-hour agenda? Commissioner Hyatt? Aye. Commissioner Anthony? Aye. Commissioner Murphy? Aye. We'll move to agenda item number four, and that's uh, uh, PUD's application uh, uh, on the decommissioning. And uh, first, we need to take a vote as to whether we would like to advance, uh, uh, vote on a motion to advance as to whether to advance this to an en banc hearing. Kendall, would you? I support the we, motion. Okay. I don't know that we need to call the roll on that. I support uh, the oral arguments. All right. So we will, we will grant the oral arguments. And uh, Mr. Klein, I think you're leading the train on this, so I'll turn it to you. Jeff Klein for the Public Utility Division. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, we're here today for a hearing on PUD's motions. We filed two separate motions. The first one is the motion to advance and specially set before the Commission and Bank. The second is the, an emergency motion to determine decommissioning plan to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, each of these were filed in cause number PUD 2021-00090. That is the application of Brandy L. Reith, Director of the Public Utility Division of the Oklahoma Corporation Commission for a show cause hearing against Olympia Renewable Platform, LLC. Um, I have some background statements that I can make, and then we do have a witness that I would like to present to the commissioners, so that way you all can have some first-hand account of what is happening in the situation. And I did pre prepare a proposed order. I do know it will need some tweaks. Uh, of course, depending on how today goes in general, it will need some, some changes. But this is a cause of first impression. This is the first time this, this issue has ever come up before this commission. Uh, and it, it's kind of going to be an interesting thing to see how this goes. But this is a show cause filing. We intentionally did not file it as an enforcement proceeding. We 100% believe we could have filed it as an enforcement proceeding for violation of state law and also for of commission rules, but we are not seeking any fines or any penalties in this case. We are only seeking compliance. Depending on how the, this proceeding goes, then we might seek fines through another case, through an enforcement action, but for today, just the show cause. So the legislature gave the commission the authority to, and this is from the statute in 17 OS section 160.12, paragraph 6, uh, 
to protect the public against health safety hazards, standards for the decommissioning of wind energy facilities should be established and assurance of adequate financial resources should be given so that the wind energy systems can be properly decommissioned at the end of their useful life. And the commission, or the, the legislature specifically gave that authority to this commission. PUD filed this application as an emergency and we're requesting that it be treated as an emergency pursuant to OAC 165, 5-9-3 due to the immediate hazard to the public health, safety, and welfare. As I stated earlier, Mr. Reith is prepared to testify about the situation and, and, and what needs to be done to address this situation too. We also believe that it's most appropriate to hear before the commission today and not refer it to an administrative law judge due to the dangerous hazards that are affecting the public. Uh, we are asking that this tr be treated as a, an emergency, as I mentioned, pursuant to the Chapter 5 rule. Uh, however, pursuant to that rule, we actually don't have to have a hearing. We wanted to have a hearing because we wanted to make sure that the Commission knows what's going on and because this is a case of first impression. Uh, we've also taken steps to notify the owner of the, uh, and the operator of the facility. Uh, Mr. Reith has spoken to the owner and he, the owner knows what's going on. We've sent the application by certified mail. I cannot tell you today whether or not we've received the green card back, but we've also sent it via email to the landowner as well. And we sent the motion along with the application. So they have received all of the documents relating to this cause. I do not believe that there are gonna be any other participants in for, in for today's hearing. I believe it is just gonna be Mr. Reith and me. Uh, if there are any other questions about the, the law or about any notice, I'd be happy to answer any of those. Uh, otherwise, I'd like to call my first witness, which would be Mr. Reith. Other questions regarding notice? Um, I just had one question besides it's really great to see you in person, and I wanted to tell you that, and to see some of the others I haven't seen in a while in person. It's really great to to see them. Um, I've got the rule out under 165 5-9-3 for an exception to the emergency and I would agree with you it wouldn't have required notice in a hearing and I'm, I'm, I think the path you've taken is appropriate as far as the hearing is concerned but it would still take an order so it would be very hard for this commission to one issue an order if we didn't have any evidence to consider so uh, I would be concerned and would only think that exception would be utilized in the most emergency type of situations. I'm thoughtful about my colleague, Commissioner Anthony, who at one time admissioned, you know, do we just have normal emergencies? I don't think this is a normal emergency, but I just, I would be a little bit concerned about how the exception would be. I wouldn't want to sign an order if I didn't know anything about it. So I appreciate the efforts that have been made. I was going to ask the question about why it wasn't filed as an enforcement, but you've responded to that. And other than that, I don't have any questions about that component. Thank you. See no further questions. And so uh, at this time, let's take appearances. Commissioner, would you like for me to maintain my spot here and have Mr. Reith go to the witness stand? Or would you prefer him be maybe sit right here? I think I think just sit right out there just so that we're all distanced. And which, by the way, I notice everyone uh, in the gallery has still has masks. But to, to the extent you're socially distanced and feel comfortable, you may take your mask off if, if you wish. But All right. So we'll take appearances. Jeff Klein for the Public Utility Division. Okay. All right. And that's... I believe all of our appearances, so we will uh, we will swear in the witness. Uh, with your right hand raised, do you uh, swear or affirm that uh, the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Witnesses admitted. Will you please state your name for the record? Brandy Lloyd Reith. Who are you employed by, and what is your title? I'm employed by the Oklahoma Corporation Commission in the Public Utility Division as the Director of the Public Utility Division. Have you testified before this commission before and were your credentials accepted at that time? Yes, I have and yes, they were. Will you please give a brief overview of this application and the emergency motion? 
Yes, the, the motion that you have before you today, commissioners, is the result of a referral from a state senator's office that had a constituent in the panhandle make a report of what they believed to be an unsafe wind facility. Uh, this report came in on the 20th. And so what we did is we first dispatched one of our field enforcement officers to visually inspect the site, uh, which resulted in another follow-up that I know we'll talk about later. And in that on-site visit, we found a very dangerous situation, in our opinion, for the public with dilapidated, damaged wind turbines in the area. And we're requesting today that the company be required to submit what we believe to be some de minimis information on confirming conversations we'd had with them on turbines that are to be repaired and what the plan is, on turbines that cannot be repaired and what the plan is, and more importantly, what the plan is to immediately make the site safe for the public. Has the commission seen this type of issue before? Not in my time at the commission. This, this was a first for us. And what is the commission's authority when it comes to this type of issue? So in the Oklahoma Wind Act, as I know was first mentioned in the application and in discussion, was that the commission is charged with ensuring some public safety provisions, and it's very explicit in this statute. And I go back to the discussions um, that I know Commissioner Murphy shared in many of them back when this was actually developed. One of the big concerns was the what happens if conversations. Now I will tell you, this is not what we expected the what happens if to be, but it was anticipated that a time would come that a turbine would either not be safe or that it was time for it to no longer be used for electric generation. And the legislature's stated intent at that time was to ensure there was a process to ensure Oklahoma's landscape, number one, remained safe, and number two, wasn't left with visual blight even, not just public safety, but visual blight. So our authority is that we're supposed to be watching out out for these to make sure there is a plan in place and to make sure that companies follow decommissioning plans, that they have the plans, and that they show financial ability to do these things in the event they occur. Now, where is this wind energy facility located? Without giving, we do have exact GPS coordinates, but commissioners, we have chosen today not to put that into the record because we do literally have a concern uh, because this is interesting. We don't want people to go on site um, and have access to these and get too close and have potential harm. And we can talk more about that later, but I will say these are south of Guymon, uh, right near the Oklahoma-Texas border. And I think you may have mentioned, but I just want to make sure to know, how did PUD come to learn about the issues with this facility? This came to us from Senator Casey Murdoch's office from a constituent uh, notice that they received on the 20th. Um, and so we began the on-site visits on the 21st. Have you personally visited this facility? I have. After uh, We had Jason Chaplin, who you all know is our Southwest Power Pole expert, but he also serves in capacity to assist as our wind expert. Uh, he made an initial visit on that Friday, the 21st, and based on what he found, we felt that it was necessary to make a closer visual inspection using some of our drone technology and, and to really get a feel for is it ugly, is it dangerous, is it both? And so I went up on the 26th uh, in, in partnership with Dennis Epley and Brandon Jimenez from our field enforcement group and did a a visual tour of the facility with one of the operators from the company kind of walked us around, talked to us about some of the things, as well as we were able to have a meeting, a short meeting, but was able to meet with the landowner, Mr. Lee, uh, whose land the majority of these um, dangerous or dilapidated turbines are sitting on. So that was on the 26th. Do you have a copy of the application that was filed on May 24th? I do. I have my electronic copy with me. And let's talk about the pictures that are attached to the application that are listed as exhibits. Do these pictures accurately reflect the turbines that you visited on when you, when you got to visit it in person? They do, but I will say this is just a small sampling of the number of damaged turbines. The photos that were attached to the application were the ones provided by the actual constituent that called in the complaint. So we did go, again, we went on site to make sure before we filed. That's why you didn't see the filing sooner. Um, not to doubt the constituent, but to file an emergency application, we needed to be sure we had seen it, made sure it was on the Oklahoma side because this, um, 
there's wind turbines that straddle both. Um, and it was a very close proximity to the, like literally as we were driving between turbines, you would cross over state line kind of going back and forth. So very close to, um, to that border. But so there are more turbines than what you see in these pictures. And we will prepare if we have to go further or if this turns into an enforcement action, we would put the complete listing of those in the record. But today, since we were just asking for basically some de minimis reports to ensure action was going to be taken, we did not feel like flooding the record with, you know, a lot of footage and extraneous information. About how many turbines are part of this wind energy facility? You know, that, that's one of the questions that we actually have. Uh, the short version of the story is this was originally built back in 2012 by a Korean company under the the De Novus Wind Project, D Wind Novus Project, and that company faced some financial difficulties, was sold off to Daewoo difficulties, and then sold to an investment firm who actually now owns it, known as Olympia. And we've we've had intermittent reports from them. This is one that I know um, our former wind expert, whose name was E.J. Thomas, had worked with them and had been trying to get reports and fees on file and kind of had some non-responsiveness on getting the fees paid and information. We were able to, he was able to get an annual report from them at least to see that they they were showing that they still owned roughly 80 megawatts you know, at that time, but it was of course not producing <laughs> that level since the majority of the farm is down. But we that's part of the report that we really need updated. What do they still own and how many of them are active, how many of them are not active, that's all very unclear. And I will say the message was even um, difficult to ascertain while we were on the field um, because ones that would look okay uh, I'll just give you an example. As, as we were sitting there getting footage of one, we heard a sound and looked up, and one of those giant turbines that looked fine, as we pulled up, had a giant crack running from the base all the way up to the top. So I had to very quickly get our other enforcement officers to move our vehicle out of the way of this turbine just in case. I mean, it, it's not trying to be overly dramatic. This is a, a precarious situation um, that, that we saw out there. About how many turbines are currently operational? We're not sure the exact number. The gentleman that we were able to meet with that's currently, as I would say, operating the system said that he believed they had about 30% of the turbines operational, but that's part of what we need to verify. The listed respondent in this application uh, is the owner of this facility, correct? That is correct, and, and I will say um, we were looking at some of those reports they had submitted. We were trying to check legal documents to get information. Uh, we're very thankful to our uh, folks over at the Oklahoma you know, Power Alliance. They, were, they, are not, this, they are not members of the wind group here in the state, but they were able to find contacts to help us get to someone. And so they were able to get me on the phone. And we've had numerous phone calls with the operator owner, uh, one of the owners. Again, it's an investment firm, but one of the representatives who is an investing member we've been having regular conversations with. And I will say, in those conversations, we gave them a heads up on the 20th that this filing was coming, then talked with them again about it on the 26th. So the reports we're asking you for, we told them then what they needed to be preparing. So they, we let them know from day one, here's what we're going to need, need to see from you as soon as possible. So you have spoken to the owner of this facility? Yes, I have. And does the respondent at this time, do you know if they have an attorney representing them? I do not know, and I will say um, they had been very responsive. I did send them another note to make sure they, if they were going to be here today, and they did not respond back. So that, that's unusual, but we will, we will keep trying to stay in touch with them as much as possible. Will you please summarize the actions that the owner is already taking? <laughs> That's a difficult one. Um, we, we had a, and I'll keep it brief, commissioners, because none of this can be confirmed at this point because we have nothing in writing and we haven't seen any of this. Uh, what we were able to do, uh, as I stated, was meet with one of the representatives who um, were reported by the owner who I was speaking with. He reported this was the field operations person who was running the facility physically. So that's who showed up at the site to meet with us. And he explained some actions that they were taking. Now keep in mind, we, I don't run a wind farm. 
I, I've never ran a wind farm. I've never operated a wind farm. But I will say in the conversation, I left with many more concerns and questions than before I got there, keeping in mind I had already seen the damage and my concerns still grew. Um, he was talking about the inability to get parts. He was talking about going in and shoring off, shearing off the turbines, but then talking about how that was resulting in these internal couplings vibrating to the point that he thinks that's what has made most of them fail but yet he was still talking about continuing to pin the turbines. Um, on, on the ones, and, and these you don't even see the videos, commissioners, two of them are completely burnt to a crisp um, from the top, and I mean completely open, and we'll have footage, you'll be able to see that. Uh, and, and when asking, well, my goodness, what caused that open you know, flame fire? It's scary enough one's breaking, but these were literally a fire. Well, maybe lightning, maybe not. Well, one of them we settled with an insurance company. Well, maybe we didn't. So the stories have been non-confirmed at this point. And what we're kind of hoping for with this report, as bad as this turbine, is, as bad as this situation is, commissioners, our plan, if we can get this report from them, we will then hire someone under our general PD authority and budget to look at the plan and tell us if this is tenable, if this is actually going to make it safe. Um, because currently, for example, there's no fencing around these. So anyone driving on a road between two certain cities out there in the panhandle, which again, that's how this was seen, a grandmother who every weekend had to go pick up a grandchild, had seen one of them like this for over five years. But when she saw a new one last month, got scared and wanted to report it because said these are too close to the road. If these things are still burning out and breaking, someone's got to do something who can help. So there's no fences. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I was raised in the country. And, you know, most Friday and Saturday nights, about all you had to do was go out in the field, star watch, ride your motorcycle, you know. And, and these aren't fenced off. So people can get into that field. If they're driving down the road and it looks interesting, they can literally walk right up to the base of these turbines. Um and, and the gentleman that met with us out there, was t he talked about it very nonchalantly. Well, they're just shedding some parts. So talked about having to rent a very heavy-duty bulldozer with a very heavy-duty cabin so they could safely drive to get parts pulled off the field, while the poor landowner who stops and talks to us for quite a while doesn't have a heavy-duty bulldozer with a heavy-duty cabin on it to use his own field. So my concern isn't, I mean, these are ugly, and I would not want to look at them every day. But I did not bring an emergency to you today for an ugly wind farm. I brought you an emergency today for a wind farm that I physically heard things cracking. I was watching 120-foot pieces, basically, guessing the distances, but you'll see in the pictures, the full length of an arm that is shattered, um, and if you look in the filing, you can see the one I'm talking about, so you can get an order of magnitude of size. It is exhibit number, it's on page five. It's listed exhibit one, but it's on page five. And it looks like it's melted. Every one of those turbines that you see hanging down, commissioners, are blowing in the wind. And you can see them blowing far out one side, and going far back the other side, and they're right over the access road in this okay. farmer's field. So again, we're not talking about damage that's been done and is ugly. We're talking about active and ongoing failure of this wind farm. That definitely poses a public safety. It ended up, I was very thankful for our technology we have that we were able to get away from the turbines and send our unmanned vehicle in there to get the pictures so we didn't have to be close to them. And I'm not someone whose nerves get um, on edge very easy, and I didn't even want to get our folks close to it. You mentioned that the facility doesn't have any fence around it. What is the respondent doing to secure the facility right now? We have. He did not report any actions that they're currently taking. Um, the gentleman that we were able to speak to, they, they were talking about difficulties in ordering parts and backlog of pieces and getting stuff from overseas. Um, they talked about that they were going to need to chop them down, and I quote, like a tree, 
and that that was giving the landowners obvious concern of what happens when you do that. What about fluids inside? What about environmental? What are you going to hit? What damage is it going to do? Um, so from what I can report today, it sounds like they've had a lot of conversation. Keeping in mind, some of these apparently have been damaged for years, but no actual action taken. And one of the things I made clear in one of the phone calls uh, with one of the investor owners, I said, I'm not asking you when you can get this generating power. I'm asking you, when can you make it safe for people to be in the area? That's what we need to know right now. Are you aware how long it will take to determine which turbines can be rehabilitated? Th that's an interesting one. In, in talking again to the investor owner, he made it sound like they had already done that analysis. And he was the one who told me that they had some that would not be able to be rebuilt. That's why we know there's ones that should have a decommissioning plan. We just don't know how many of them. Um, and the gentleman in the field said the same thing. Didn't give us a number, said that was kind of beyond his, you know, but he knew that some of them could not be rebuilt. And then he again was telling us about the chopping them down and what that was going to be like. So keeping in mind that some of these definitely, if they fell the wrong way, would fall onto um, power lines, streets, infrastructure, you know, there's one that is, there's a couple actually that are really near what looks to be a pig farm. We weren't able to talk to anyone at that one, but you'll see it in the photos. Uh, these things are very close to act. They're not just in empty fields. Uh, and again, even if it was just an empty field, you know, it still has to be in a dry. We, if there's oil and when I, when I asked, for example, about, well, what about the fluids in them? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that all burned up. I'm pretty sure versus positive. Um, are, are two different things, especially when we're talking about farmland in our state, you know, or, or grazing land. I, I don't know about y'all, but I wouldn't want to run my cows on a field that had a giant hydraulic or oil spill on it. So l lots of concerns. Do you know whether the respondent has evidence of financial security to cover the anticipated costs of decommissioning the unrepairable portions of the wind energy facility? No, we are not aware. And again, commissioners, that's one of the things we're kind of asking for in an emergency. Um, and, and I won't speak speculation, but what I will say is based on the operational status of these farms as they are now and based on conversations where instead of safety being the primary discussion, the discussion was about cost benefit analysis and what it was going to cost to do things when I was speaking with representatives from the company. What we don't want to do is wait too long and another company walks away from it. Because, you know, what we've learned from this is we had a company walk away from these turbines. And so we don't want that to happen again, especially without knowing there's some financial ability to fix it. Because right now, we were able to see some producing. We're trying to check contacts with SBP and with Golden Spread and, and other folks to see if we can find out what they're putting into the system. Um, but we just want to make sure and protect the public that someone isn't able to walk away cheaper than fixing. And not saying they would do that, not saying they said that, but that's always a realistic possibility since someone did do that in 2012 to this wind facility. To date, just to confirm, to date, as of today, the respondent has not provided you the evidence of that financial security? That is correct. They have not provided that. So in your emergency motion, uh, you're requesting that the commission issue an order direct, directing the respondent to provide to PUD within 10 business days a decommissioning plan, evidence of financial security to cover the anticipated costs of decommissioning the facility, a plan to secure and repair the facility if the respondent chooses to rehabilitate the certain wind turbines, and fourth, a plan to rehabilitate any wind turbines, correct? That is correct. And for each of these, you're requesting a 10 business day response time. Do you believe that 10 business days is a reasonable amount of time to provide this information? I do, commissioners. Um, keeping in mind, my first conversation with these folks was around that first trip on, on the, the 20th, right when we heard about it and we were able to get contact. And we did let them know what we would need. They did not seem concerned about the idea of putting this together. And again, probably some of the most important is what's the plan. Um, and, and I would basically say if they've known this was going on for a while and they don't have a plan, that may tell us more. Um, more information we need to know if they need more than 10 days to get us a how we're going to get safe plan.
Mr. Reith, why should these motions be heard and ruled upon today instead of being referred to an administrative law judge? Based on what I was able to see on site, um, I'm kind of those what we know haunts me more than what I don't know. And, and what I saw uh, gave me fear. What I saw made me uncomfortable. In speaking to Mr. Robert E. Lee, whose name I'll never forget, and he joked about it, he's one of the landowners, and I told him we were having this hearing, and he thanked us for being there, by the way, commissioners, for representing them, um, and to know how to make contact with us now. I made sure he had my cell phone, him and his son. Um, but after speaking with him and hearing about the concerns and what they've seen, uh, I, I don't think that we can let this go any longer without making sure, and, and I was clear with this to the owners that I talked to, what I needed to make abundantly clear to them, and I think your order does it much better than my word, is we know about this, this is an emergency, and your decision must not be a cost-benefit analysis. Your decision must be how do we make this safe for the public in this area. So that that is why I think that this was important enough that we needed it before the commissioners and that I would respectfully beg for a fast order to make sure this company um, knows that this is important and not that they would, but to ensure they don't have the opportunity to slow play a response. Mr. Reith, this will hopefully be my last question. After you receive these four items, these plans from the respondent, what do you believe should be PUD's next step in this action? Yeah, yeah. honestly, receiving those reports is probably going to be about the beginning of the hard work on this. Um, we, Like I say, we are going to reserve our right to get a contracted person to review the plan for us just to make sure that all the options are being followed. And then we will have to follow through with the, depending on what the plans are and the robustness of response, we will then decide about moving forward with an enforcement. And again, commissioners, we I want to be clear about that. It's not that we didn't file this because we don't think there should be fines here. We filed this today to make it clear, let's get compliant and safe first. But I did make it clear to the company, they will be talking to us again, and it will be about potential fines and penalties. Even if it's keeping those going to ensure the company stays moving on making this facility safe. Because as you know, the WIND Act was wonderful enough to give us a $1,500 a day per occurrence. And so with the number of turbines that are up there with problems, if they're not being made safe and they're not getting the plans in place and they're not providing us with the financial surety, those penalties will rack up very quickly. And as I stated to the company, and I'll quote myself, we're going to take cost-benefit analysis out of the equation. <laughs> it's going to cost more not to do anything than to get out there and get a plan and get this fixed for for the landowners in the area. That's really our goal here. And if they get into compliance, as you know, PUD is very flexible with folks. If they get into compliance and they do the right thing, we always reserve the right to drop those enforcement type actions if we see compliance is being obtained. Commissioners, those are all the questions that I have for Mr. Reith at this time. Questions of commissioners. Are you going to offer the exhibit? Since it's included in the uh, application, I wasn't planning on it, but certainly we can. And I can go upstairs and print off some color copies to give to our court reporter. I'm not sure the best way to handle it because we don't really have particular rules about show cause, but uh, typically in emergency oil and gas type things, they are submitted as exhibits because you got a witness that took the photos and has given the testimony about it. So I think that's a better way to establish it than just kind of submitting a filing. Oh. So I, I would suggest that you could offer those to the, to the, offer these to the chairman. It's already marked as exhibit one. It would need to have the court reporter mark it, but I, I think it probably could be a late filed exhibit or something like that. Sure. So I, I would suggest that you offer those to be admitted. And Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I, if, if it would be acceptable, I will go ahead and print these off and get them filed as exhibits for this hearing and provide one to the court reporter at the end of this hearing. And I would request that these be admitted into evidence. Yeah, the, the court reporter wants to know if you could just email them and then she can mark them as an exhibit. Even easier. Okay. Um, I do have just a couple of 
And and probably my first question, Jeff, might go to you because I'm looking at the statute under 160.15, and the testimony given was that the facility was established uh, commercial generation in 2012. And the statute says that if there was commercial generation prior to December 31st, 2016, which is the case, the evidence of financial security shall be submitted after the 15th year of operation of the facility. So I understand the circumstances here are different, but I see what the statute requires. And it doesn't, it says shall be submitted after the 15th year. It doesn't say maybe, it says shall be. So... I just think from a legal standpoint, how would you address that? I would believe we would need to read this statute along with some of the other statutes that talk about operating the facility in a safe manner. And if the facility is not being operated in a safe manner and is a threat to the public harm, as we're arguing these are, then they need to be decommissioned. And if they need to be decommissioned, then they need to provide the evidence of financial security. So I think reading this alone you're right. I doubt they've gotten to the, the year time period to require them to provide it. So I, I wouldn't say that they're out of date necessarily, but I think we need to read everything together. Okay, because I, I think part of my concern is when you go further down into the statute, it says that the financial security has to be accompanied by an estimate of the total cost of decommissioning minus the salvage value of the equipment prepared by a professional engineer licensed in the state. It also goes on to say uh, it gives a couple of other requirements. Um, it seems like, let's say you read it all together, it seems like that would be a challenge to get put together in 10 days from a legal standpoint. So kind of give me, I mean, you're going to have to get a professional engineer that's licensed. So are you asking for... Is the request for something different than what the statute requires because of the circumstance? Or, or are you asking for this decommissioning plan that follows the statute? And if that's the case, I couldn't imagine anybody could have it done in 10 days. I believe Mr. Reith has an answer for this question. Okay. And, and thank you, Commissioner. We actually talked about that before moving ahead with the application and went ahead with the 10 days after discussions with the owner operator and the field personnel that both stated they had already identified the ones to be decommissioned and had those plans and by their own mouths were working with landowners on how to best decommission so they had so to do that requires them to have had those studies already done. We just need them to put what they already know on paper. So we are asking for that, but I believe based on their um, their assertions and our attempt to get them here today if they felt otherwise, because they did receive these um, when we filed them, that they've had their opportunity to say otherwise and have not done so. Okay, because my concern would be that the owner doesn't know what the statute requires. If you indicated, I mean, if he indicated to you that well, they're working on a plan and working with the landowners. Well, this this is pretty specific about what is required. So I think him indicating they have a plan or they're working on a plan, I don't know that he has this or knows what's required. And we did make sure they had statutory, the provisions, um, and, in, that's, and I did make sure Mr. Klein included that, you know, the statute sites in the filing before we sent it to them. And also, commissioners, I'd rather tell them they got 10 days, and if they can't come in, let them come in and file something asking for more time because we, again, after seeing it, um, we just want to push this. Honestly, Jeff had to talk me into 10. Um, I, I, was, I was hoping for a few days turnaround. Uh, I was so concerned. So I'm not saying it's ideal, but I think the company's had years to figure out the ones that have been that way for a while. So these new ones that are down and dangling, I just don't want to give them more time than we absolutely have to. Knowing that if something happens and they come in and file a motion and show they're working on it, I know our commission is reasonable um, and would work with them, but I'd like to see some activity by them before just making it too easy, I guess. Well, I still have concerns about, I, I think there's kind of a hole in the statute myself. I think it's a, a gap that probably needs to be um, to be dealt with, and now that we've got this situation, I think that's a good indication of, of how it could be <clears throat> dealt with. I just, 
I don't know. I have concerns about the the 10 days um, time frame. I understand why you're asking for it, so I don't find any fault with that. I just have a problem with issuing an order that do you think there's a realistic likelihood that they're going to to complete it, and that's not the reason you should use the time frame. But and then just the specifics of what is required. I, I think it would be a challenge to get that done in 10 days, and then to use that. Uh, against them, I have a little bit of a of a concern about that. I thought I had additional questions about, um, you know, the turbines, but I, I think I'm fine. I noticed the application that was filed has different wording than the emergency. The application says the wind energy facility is in a state of disrepair and poses a hazard, and the emergency says several wind turbines are in a state of disrepair. And then instead of hazard, it says immediate hazard. So there's a little bit of a difference in the wording there, which is is somewhat concerning, but it, it, in the scheme of things, not really. But I think there, that there should be some congruity between the application and the emergency um, about what's what's needed. So, um, Commissioner. I, I appreciate the. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry, I, don't, I don't, didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, if I may, though, on with regards, I'll take a step back on the decommissioning plan. Even if we can't get a true decommissioning plan that's compliant with the statute, at a minimum, we need to know which turbines need to be decommissioned and which turbines can be rehabilitated. That I, should hopefully be able to be provided with. And I, I don't have a problem with that. But to call it a decommissioning plan is defined by the statute, gives it a whole other context than what you just indicated. So I think the wording would need to be different than indicating it's the decommissioning plan under the statute. So I think if it was worded a little bit different, then you wouldn't have the statutory ramifications to it, and it probably could address more of what you're talking about. So I, I guess I would that would be what I would suggest to my colleagues. We don't call it a decommissioning plan under the statute, but we call it a plan to whatever you've suggested, uh, Jeff, to identify which turbines need to – I think it just that, – that terminology would need to be um, changed. And it almost makes me wonder if – I still have a little bit of problem with the statutory and what it says shall be done and what we're seeking to be done in a show cause. And since you told the owner probably you weren't seeking a fine, that might have been part of the reason they decided not to show up. I mean, who knows? Who can figure that out? So I don't think I have any additional questions, but I, I'm not sure I would be supportive of the 10 days. I'm, I'd, I'd have to think about and see what the other commissioners might suggest as far as a time frame. I would suggest the decommissioning plan language be changed and... Some of the other information I think can be, I mean, it seems like that seems reasonable, and I'm still kind of struggling with the financial security um, component. So I don't know if you could ask for financial security to cover the costs of, of what needs to be repaired and what's in disrepair instead of asking for the financial security for the entire facility. Um, for, for it to be decommissioned, because I think Brandy indicated the whole facility, you don't know yet what is really working and what might be generating power and what is not. So, again, I think the words make a difference in relation to the statute. Um, I really appreciate what you all have provided, and I don't think I have any additional questions. So some of my thing options were questions, and some of them were suggestions about how I think some of the wording should be adjusted. And Commissioner, to address your, your thoughts on the difference in language between the show cause application and the emergency motion, part of that dealt with the gravity of the situation. We did not understand how severe this was at the time the show cause application was filed. We only had the information that was provided from the state senator and from the constituent. By the time we got to the 26th when we filed the emergency motion, we knew what was going on. We had firsthand accounts from Mr. Reith and his team of going out there, and we knew that we needed to beef up the language and to accurately reflect the situation that was at hand. And I appreciate that makes a lot of sense to me, so I appreciate that explanation. So you've, you've covered that. I've indicated what my concerns are, and um, I, I'm just looking over your order. I, I could be suggesting some language, but 
I'm I, I'm just struggling to support um, 10 days. I don't know what the right time frame would be. Um, I don't know if it should be 30 days or I don't. It seems like it needs to be something that's kind of reasonable because then when you seek to go after them, if that's what happens and they don't comply, it seems a little bit of a of a better basis to then coming in and seeking a fine. Oh, I know what my last question was, Brandy. I'm so sorry. I finally got my train of thought back together. When a company does not file its report, which is required, and it's required on their the annual report, the power generated from the wind turbine or wind energy facility, the nameplate capacity of the wind turbine or wind energy facility, and the location of the wind turbine or wind energy facility. Do we do like what they do in oil and gas if somebody doesn't submit their report or do their, their surety appropriately? We send them a letter. What do we do? Letter, email, phone call, letter, email, phone call, and just keep keep after it. Um, I know that Mr. Thomas was able to push and push and push last year to finally get the report. They just never followed up with the money for the fee. And it would be my understanding under the statute, it doesn't matter whether they're generating power or not. They still have to file the annual report because it has to get the nameplate capacity and where it's located, no right. matter what, right? Right. And, and, and it, that's correct, Commissioner, whether it is producing or not. And what I would say is as you're looking for your decision about the decommissioning, if you look at 16.14 and look at some of the specific language in that one, because it talks about that they're supposed to already have decommissioned within 12 months of certain provisions, um, knowing that some of these turbines have been down for years, so they're already in violation of that section. Also, it talks about um, at abandonment, end of useful life, um, so these are kind of separate from that part, cause, and that's one of the reasons we didn't go for penalties here, because this wasn't about trying to create a time frame for how many $1,500 to charge them for on the decommissioning plan, but what we're trying to do is show that they've met all the intent under 160.14, where it talks about what is decommissioning, and so it talks about the things they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do them, and so we believe that it's reasonable under that intent of the statute to request the same type of plan now that we know that there are turbines that are beyond that 12 months and that there's ones that have just recently went to the status where they need to be decommissioned that since they didn't make it to the 15th year, we need that same protection in place. And, and again, that's one reason we did it this way, to basically get a decision from the commissioners because the statute, um, that's one of the areas that I don't think was anticipated that isn't clear. And so we're hoping with this case, and that's one of the reasons Mr. Klein was calling this a case of first impressions, we kind of know what we do here. While it may not be precedential, we know it will sure give guidance if this happens in the future. And the message we're hoping to send is if you have a turbine that is at the end of its life, you need to let us know and you need to have a plan in place and you need to be sure you can afford to get that thing taken down. What I don't want to happen here is what happened when D-Wind walked out of the state. And luckily Olympia Bottom, you know, uh, they, they have had some operational issues. They've had failure under their operations. So I think we need to get a plan. But, but I... In my reading, and I will say I pushed Mr. Klein and said, this is the one that drives me, this intent of what decommissioning means, and I believe where these turbines are from their own mouth, they've met some of these provisions. Um, we definitely know there's some that should have already been decommissioned because they've been out of status more than 12 months, and so we've got some serious you know, violations of that intent. I, I've got the 20, um, I've got the 160.14, and I, I see about the 12 months. Um, I understand that, but it's, we're not here on the merits of the case. That's the problem. We're here on a show cause. Mm -hmm. So we're not on the merits of where is it established that it's 12 months and where is it established. I mean, you have to have the evidence that establishes those things. And and I, I feel like we're, we're tipping the line between a show cause, emergency hearing, uh, a contempt. So I don't have any issue with the appropriateness of what you've brought today. And I want to make that really clear. But I think if we're going to give guidance, I think we better be looking at what we're following. And so 
it's like an emergency case when we have other emergency case. We're not approving a spacing unit. We're approving a, you can go ahead and drill your well or something like that. But in a situation like this, we, we don't have the evidence of these, these. We, we, we would have to have that as actual evidence. You said you think that, but I mean, do, do we have that documented? Do we know that? And it's not put in this record for this cause. That would be my concern. But but I understand what you're saying. I don't I don't want you to think yeah. I'm I have an issue with what you're saying. I I just think that I don't have a problem with issuing an order. I think the language needs to be tweaked. And if the other commissioners want to provide for the 10 days, I, I probably won't participate in the order because I, I I think 10 days is not sufficient. Commissioner, instead of a decommissioning plan and the evidence of financial security, we could always ask or have in the order a line that instead they must provide a status update within 10, day, 10 business days as to when it would be prepared. Something along those lines could also be an option. However, we do need for sure the items relating to a plan to secure and repair the facility and a plan to rehabilitate. There are certain things that we have to have and then the decommit, the actual true de decommissioning plan that's in statute if it takes more time, they can tell us that, and they need to tell us when it will be prepared within the 10 business days. Well, as I indicated, I don't, I'm not being argumentative. I'm just letting you on, though. I'm supportive of what you've done. I've expressed my concerns. I think it's just going to come down to language, and I don't have a problem with somebody trying to update you in 10 days, but I just have a problem on tripping the trigger on all of this for 10 days. That's what I have. That's I'm struggling with that. I, I just don't generally think I support that. Commissioner, might I add one thing that might help? I, I think what might be helpful here, or what I would modify the request based on the concerns if it's shared, um, if we could keep the 10 days on them submitting a plan to make the site safe for the public, and then move to 30 days for a full decommissioning and repowering plan, I'm fine with that. My, my biggest concern is the fact you can walk right up to these things without any encumbrance right off of a, up of a, it's a country road, but it's the highway between two cities. I mean, it's as a big road as you get out there. Um, and so I think, I mean, that would be very, I mean, for me, that's the primary concern of the emergency today is the ease with which people have access to this dangerous situation. I think that makes more sense. I, w I would support that. I, I Further questions? All right, I think uh, we have our direction. I, I believe uh, this is a judicial case, so we can walk it through um, either today or tomorrow. And, and uh, once we have the, the language fully de developed in the order, does that sound acceptable to everyone? All right. Okay, move us to agenda item number five. Commissioner Anthony, this is your posting. I'll turn to, turn to you. Thank you. Um, I posted a few items here that um, I wish to raise as we move forward to uh, deal with the application involving Fort Sill. Uh, the first one here uh, mentions uh, some of the major military uh, insta uh, missions and installations. Um, the, uh, as we discussed at the hearing, uh, the Army has kind of a, a top level when it comes to its principal mission of combat, something called the combat arms. Certainly we don't leave out uh, the combat helicopter pilots and the combat engineers and the special forces. But um, uh, to my way of thinking, there's four major combat arms and uh, one of them that I, I think is the oldest and one that people think of uh, first is infantry, and that's been at Fort Benning, Georgia, for many, many years. Um, also, there's the armor, and I misspoke at the hearing when I said that was at Fort Knox. Um, it's been at Fort Knox for uh, a long, long time, and uh, General Patton Museum and so forth is very famous, uh, but recently it's been moved, and it was moved to uh, join the infantry at Fort Benning. So there's 
two of the four that are now located uh, together at uh, Fort Benning. Uh, then there's the artillery, which uh, we've discussed the history of Fort Sill and the field artillery has been there with a, a relationship of, of 100 years plus. Um, by the way, part of the name of FIRES, F-I-R-E-S, it has, goes back to that period of time. So that's why that word appears in some of the filings that we have. All right. Then there was uh, the air defense artillery as opposed to just the field artillery, and that's been at Fort Bliss. But that recently was moved uh, to Fort Sill. So of the four uh, combat arms that we've just mentioned, they used to be at four different forts, and now they're at two. Uh, one's uh, got two of them at Fort Sill, air defense artillery and field artillery, and Fort Benning, Georgia, which is the infantry, and the armor. And armor means tanks and other things. You need to make sure the court reporter can hear you, because when you turn this way and you're not speaking into the microphone, I can tell she's struggling a little bit. Thank you. Good, good idea. Um, and uh, the reason I dwell on that is, um, of all the places in the United States that they could put uh, two of the uh, major combat arms, uh, they now, for several years, uh, more than a decade, have been at uh, Fort Sill. And that's just one way of highlighting the importance. Um, I think we all understand that uh, every aspect of the military uh, embraces high technology and new technology, and, um, and that's uh, a part of why the uh, military has a, a directive uh, for um, electricity uh, generation back up and security and reliability. Um, moving right ahead, I think I could comment on item B and C uh, together. Uh, at the hearing we had the other day, I asked if anyone knew what the uh, total generating capacity, nameplate capacity was for PSO, and without looking it up, I don't think uh, an answer was uh, able to be given at that time. Uh, I think all the commissioners have a uh, copy of a fact sheet that is readily found on the website of PSO, and uh, uh, toward the bottom of this one-page document, it gives a total megawatt capability um, of 3,771 megawatts. Um, over there in the bottom left of the page two, when it talks about the energy mix, it makes mention that they have wind generation long-term contracts of another 1,137. Uh, if you put those together, you're kind of adding apples and oranges, but it puts you in the neighborhood of uh, 5,000 megawatts of um, capacity. And I asked that question at the hearing because I just wanted to have some sort of um, uh, comparison or put in perspective the application that we're considering for Fort Sill. The Fort Sill application has uh, two components that are missed, uh, that are listed in the um, agenda under item C. One is uh, uh, 10.9, we could round that off to 11 uh, megawatts, and the other one is, are the four uh, gas-fired uh, reciprocating internal combustion engines, and so there's uh, four of those at nine apiece is 36. So if you add the total application that's before us at Fort Sill, it's in the neighborhood of 47 megawatts. All right, you got 47 megawatts compared to uh, whatever number you want to use if you use the 5,000 figure. That's less than 1%. So the case that we have before us uh, if I'm reading it correctly, uh, is about adding less than or about 1% to the generating uh, capacity of uh, PSO. And uh, it's probably, to my memory, uh, for, for a 1% item received more attention and scrutiny uh, than uh, what I'm uh, think we've ever given before. 
but we're never opposed to being thorough in our work. Um, last item here, um, I and at the very top where it says possible public comment, um, I think there's two written comments that have been submitted that I wanted to uh, touch upon. And uh, the first one is, uh, if you go to our website, it's listed there and it's been received, I think, by all three offices. And it's dated uh, March 26. It's uh, by the uh, board chairman of what's called Lawton Fort Sill Chamber of Commerce. And in the middle of the page, uh, I'm not sure that you all have it readily, but uh, it, it has, I think, a very diplomatic uh, statement and one reason I want to touch on these items of public comment is if I read some of the law and some of the Supreme Court cases related to pre-approval applications like the one we have before us, they do indicate that public interest uh, uh, considerations are not only appropriate but required. So. Um, the public interest and what's in the public interest is sometimes uh, better illustrated uh, by the public comments we receive. And especially if this gentleman's the board chair at the uh, Lawton Fort Sill Chamber of Commerce. So uh, just looking at the one paragraph in the middle that has two sentences, it says, it is likely that another national base realignment is in our near future. You may recall at the hearing, I read a news article quoting uh, Senator, U.S. Senator Inhofe, who was in Enid recently, saying the same thing. Um, I also read a comment from um, Joe Biden, who was quoted in the uh, Houston Chronicle as saying, well, I'll read that exactly. Uh, it said uh, he would consider more military base closures and consolidations to save the nation billions of dollars. So those uh, issues are out there. The last of these two sentences I'm going to read is outside investment. And we do know in this PSO application, there's the, the PSO ratepayers at large, and there's the company itself and uh, they're paying, uh, whether it's their monthly utility bills or making uh, capital investments, I think that's what it's talking about. Outside investment in the base infrastructure shows our state's support for the FIRES mission. Once again, FIRES is that acronym that they used, making reference to Fort Sill. All right, I uh, touched on that bit of um, written public comment and the other one that I would put forth is actually attached for convenience uh, to the posting today. I'll only make reference to the top of page uh, two. And uh, this gentleman um, has an active responsibility uh, at Fort Sill in Lawton. Uh, he is a captain in the Navy, which is equivalent to being a, a full colonel in the um, Army or the Marines, um, and he is, uh, though retired from active service. At the top of the page, uh, it says the project, and we're talking about the project at Fort Sill, the project is a sustainable winter for Fort Sill and PSO because it would allow Fort Sill to operate in case of an emergency for 14 days without being connected to the standard electric grid. Uh, toward the end of that paragraph, it says, this project, we believe, will work as a blueprint for other military installations across the country, making the Fort Sill project a model for others. Now, I've tried to spend a fair amount of time reading the transcript and reading the filings and the, the briefs that have come in on this case. And I think that they have pointed out two uh, ongoing applications that have similarity. The, you have the one at Fort Sill, 
that the uh, Navy captain here is um, hoping that it's a blueprint for other military installations across the country and that it's a, a, a maybe a model for others. And you had one in Hawaii. Now, both of them were uh, what I would call uh, backup generation facilities. And uh, I think that that's uh, what they're looking uh, for here. So um, I know we've got other things to talk about regarding this case. Those were just some that I wanted to uh, touch upon uh, at this uh, point. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, uh, they apparently have picked uh, Fort Sill as a place in Oklahoma, as a place to come to with this application. Uh, there is a directory, I won't get into it right now, uh, I have a copy of it though right here that anybody can print off from the website, it's from the Secretary of Army and it is the Army directive that is the basis for this application. So why did they pick Oklahoma and Fort Sill and Hawaii as places uh, to uh, get started? I think that they think that uh, uh, there's two major uh, military branches that are located at Fort Sill, and so it's obviously very important. And I think Oklahoma has a reputation of being uh, supportive of uh, the military and our soldiers in arms. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Commissioner Anthony. All right, I think that moves us to uh, agenda item number six, which is the proposed order for Fort Sill. Uh, I know Commissioner Anthony has an order that he has presented. Are there any other orders that would be presented today? I'll just advise the other two commissioners that I'm actually, I'm, I'm working on one. I've read through the, uh, the different orders that have been proposed by the different parties. Hypothetically, even if I was supportive of this, I would not be supportive of the order that was submitted by Public Service Company of Oklahoma. I, I, I find assertions and information provided in there that um, would be uh, concerning to me. I still have the concern, too, about a full return to the utility based on what they said was a premium price in building the facilities. And so um, I'm, I, I want to... I would like more time to continue working on it. I know we're having a commissioner meeting on Monday, and um, I'm hoping to have some type of a, a draft that I could uh, circulate to the other um, commission offices, but I, I'm not prepared to vote on an order today, and I just wanted to go ahead and be up front and let my colleagues know that I'm, I'm actually been working on it today uh, myself on looking at all these orders and, and combining some things. but. Um, I think they're all very helpful, and I appreciate all the time and effort that all the attorneys have spent in putting them together. And I do, uh, I really appreciate the information that you provided uh, today as well, Commissioner Anthony, and the pointing out about the 1% of the capacity requirement. The problem with the 1% of the capacity requirement, it's at one of the highest costs we've ever seen. And I think that it should, it should draw our attention to that particular component. So I mentioned when we had the hearing, um, you know, just the, the proposal for starting to recover the cost before it's even being built and put in a rider before it's completed and the full return. And there's just, I, I just have some issues uh, that I want to further think through. So thank you. So it's my reading that the Attorney General's uh, proposed order um, uses the word approved, application approved. It's certainly more complicated than that. And the PSO application also is to approve the application. Are you able to say at this time whether the order you're working on is to uh, approve the application or to deny the application? I'm prepared to tell you it's gonna be a hybrid. Okay. Um, and hey, we're all just working together here. Um, some factors to consider, not that I'm 
uh, the best lawyer in the world because I'm not even a lawyer. Uh, but uh, there are a few observations. Number one, the statute pertaining to this uh, proceeding does uh, state that the commission will, no, I think it says the word shall, shall issue an order in 240 days. And the 240 days is uh, up. Uh, so we're under the gun. I bet if we are a few days beyond that, um, I don't know that it gave any penalty, like we all go to jail or something. But uh, anyway, that's hanging over our head that uh, the statute said that uh, we shall uh, get that order out. Uh, th there's another thought that, uh, frankly, uh, some of the legal advisors to my office uh, brought out. If we issue the PSO order, and if it is appealed, that uh, the company that wrote the order gets to defend the order. Uh, you know, in, in some regards, I think what the proposal is before us is, is, is a joint proposal worked out by the Department of Defense and PSO. And so, uh, if they have come forward with a proposal and we say, okay, uh, it may have some weaknesses, um, but uh, we will let it go forward, then they get to take it from there. And then the, uh, the military and the Department of Defense uh, can say, well, that commission uh, let us go forward, let us have our uh, opportunity to be a model or to uh, show how it can be done. And uh, and so I think that we uh, keep our uh, reputation of, of being uh, supportive, just like we have proved a similar, uh, not totally similar, but uh, a, a one that a application we had reference to of OG&E and Tinker Air Force Base. So. Um, I think that's a feature to it. I do uh, agree with Commissioner Murphy. I, I did read, I, I think, carefully the other proposed orders. Uh, I think the Attorney General's order uh, clearly shows that somebody who stayed up nights and days and put the references and the arguments, and it was very well organized. I would have to say that when I got to, I think, paragraph number 51, uh, when it said, oh, and by the way, this doesn't finish giving the answer. I said, what? And then they say, and this, we all know this is already June. So they say, but we're, we're ordered uh, before the end of June to give another filing to seek uh, a special contract. I think that um, is not consistent with what I thought the pre-approval statute was meant to accomplish if people had an, an issue, whether it's complying with an EPA requirement or whatever, that uh, they came to the statute and got an order with uh, more of an answer. But I, I'm sorry to be so long-winded, but I think that uh, clearly uh, the people participating in this case have given a lot of time and attention, and it is helpful to us uh, trying to come up with a final resolution. But just to be more clear, um, uh, the chairman's correct that my office uh, did take the PSO order, restyled it just a little bit, like do you do the attachments or do you do a reference? And uh, so uh, just to let you know where I am at this point, I would uh, be willing to offer for consideration uh, a motion to approve the application and issue the order that's proposed by PSO. I just offer that for further uh, conversation. Well, I could not support uh, that order. I, I personally uh, do not think it would stand across the street uh, at the Supreme Court, and I think it's incumbent upon us, and I know it is the order, uh, or basically the order that the company in uh, Fort Sill have asked for, uh, but I just 
respectfully disagree uh, that it would stand up in the Supreme Court. I, I don't think it would. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to issue an order that can stand before the Supreme Court. And I, do, I think we have time. I know we're past the 240-day mark, but uh, we have, my office has consulted uh, with Mr. Feicht, and uh, there was some discussion early about the contracts coming uh, that may be a pinch point for the company, and uh, I forget what the date was, end of July. In, end of June for, I think, the, uh, I want to say the solar facility, and for the rice facility, I think it's August 12th. Yeah, that's right. I agree. That was what and they so, indicated. So we have a few days, and we do have a posting Monday, and so maybe we can can uh, do something Monday. I know it is, Commissioner, Murf, uh, Commissioner Anthony, to your point, I know it is just 1% of the company's total load, but to use that logic would be the same as saying that uh, the law requires that we stop at red lights. So does that mean you could drive through 1% of the red lights? You know, I don't think so. Uh, I think we, we have to make it uh, conform to the statutes uh, in order to get it through the Supreme Court. So, and I think that's very possible. And I think I would also just mention, too, I think there may still be a need for a filing for a special contract, but I I could understand from the company's standpoint there wouldn't be any need to file one unless you know that, that, the, that, that this was approved. Otherwise, that would be a wasted filing. And I, I do appreciate, and I've gone back to read the... Um, the special contract for Tinker, I would note that was a settled case with intervening parties. It was for $10 million, and it didn't involve building facilities. It involved uh, OG&E becoming the owner and managing and maintaining and operating a facility. But So I do think Oklahoma has already shown that it is very willing to take on things that are supportive of the military. We've already shown that before. This is... Um, not exactly the same, but in a similar vein. So I'm very, I'm very thoughtful about that. I, I just, uh, there's just language in the PSO order that is just incredibly troubling to me. That I, I, I just, it, it the way that it's written, and I appreciate the company's going to do its best to propose an order that would be supportive of what it, it is seeking. But I, I agree with Commissioner Hyatt just as a lawyer myself I do not believe that that order could stand up at the Supreme Court based on the guidance we've had in Sierra Club and others I, I don't think it would and I don't really want to put my name on something that I don't feel like could be supported because if it has our name on it regardless of somebody else is supporting it we're the ones that issued it so I will continue to work diligently I really hope to have some kind of a draft to the other offices um, it's a short week, but hopefully something before the end of the week. I, I think Friday morning would be the latest, and hopefully sooner than that. Thank you. So if I may, I hope just offer a little conversation on a couple of points that I think that uh, some of the proposed orders took different positions. Um, first of all, we might ask ourselves, uh, where does this 14 days come from? They're saying they want a facility that uh, uh, can operate independently on an island basis for 14 days. Or, or why do they insist that it be within the fort, um, sometimes called the post? Um, and then they use the word on site. Now, that was a characteristic of the OG&E one that some of these facilities addressed there are on, on post. And uh, we might say, well, did uh, PSO and uh, the local Army um, representative uh, get together and figure that out? Uh, just for your all, maybe you've already done all this homework, but uh, this case repeatedly makes reference to Army Directive 2020-3. And uh, so it's available on the website, and I printed it out. Under purpose, uh, the first sentence says, this directive, and by the way, this is from the Secretary of Army. He's issuing a directive. He's not saying, uh, would, you, would you think about it? He's telling everybody what, what to do. This directive issues policy to strengthen energy and water 
resilience to reduce the risk to the Army missions posed by utility disruptions. All right, number five, uh, on several other topics, they come to policy. I'll just read parts of it. This directive establishes energy resilience requirements for Army installation. You have the Secretary of the Army issuing a directive that says, here, folks, are the requirements. Uh, I'll read this one. The Army will, it didn't say maybe, it said will, sustain critical missions by being capable of withstanding an extended utility outage. So why does this come up? Because uh, the Secretary of Army in this directive said it did. And by the way, there was one a few years before this that this is the updated version. All right, I only got two other parts of what he said in his requirements. It says uh, that this will, uh, this, this backup will be for a duration of a minimum of 14 days. So that's where the 14 days comes from. And then on down here, the last one, I think I'll make reference to, it said resilience considerations include secure on-site supplies of energy. So the reason that uh, Fort Sill has this proposal that's on base, on fort, on post, um, on site, is because that's what the Army has given as a directive. So that, that helps me to understand. Maybe we would say, you know, I'm kind of concerned about the cost of this. Instead of 14 days, why don't we suggest they do eight days? Uh, I'm sorry, that's not uh, what the application is about. The application is about meeting a requirement that the Army has for itself. Um, and then uh, maybe my last topic that I think I would see it different than the Attorney General did. They seem to say that the notion of a black start was not sufficiently established in the record or the evidence. Um, and so when you compare whether the cost of this um, electric generation facility is uh, too high, you need to say, well, what's it for? All right, I hope this isn't a bad example. Uh, what if I buy a house? And I've lived in my current house a long time, and I've had fire insurance for it every, every year. And I hope to live there maybe 50 years, and I hope there is never a fire. So does that mean I wasted, uh, I, I made a bad uh, investment to buy that, that fire insurance? Um, I don't think so. This facility, especially the four gas-fired units, are backup. I think... Uh, the, the hearing we heard the other day, they talked about they've had 10 years without a major disruption. So maybe you're going to say, hey, what do you need backup for? Uh, maybe there won't be a disruption. Uh, and the answer to that is this directive. We're going to prepare for anything. Uh, yesterday's uh, newspaper says that I think I got this right, the largest meatpacking plant in the world has now been cyber attacked and subject to ransoming. We saw that uh, colonial pipeline uh, impact a large part of the United States. Uh, so these type of things do happen. We've seen the winter storm uh, that affected us. All right, I'm still on the topic of the black starts. And in uh, Friday, May 8th, that's just a few days ago, the front page of the Wall Street Journal said the following, the headline is Texas grid came close to an even bigger disaster from the freeze. Okay, uh, it says the Texas grid operators, like their counterparts all over the country, rely on standby generators called black starts. When a freak winter storm hit Texas, Nine of the 13 primary generators designed to get a downed system going again were at times out of commission. Nine out of 13. Six 
of 15 secondary generations, the fail-safe for the fail-safe, had periodic trouble as well. Okay, maybe I need to read this more carefully. The application for Fort Sill is for this, black start. And I read the Attorney General's thing, and I had, uh, with Jackie's help, go to the transcripts. And between pages 80 and 88, I'll say, it discusses the black start. And what it's saying is uh, this is a feature of that proposal. Uh, no, it's not given a good deal for energy, for electricity. It's giving a, a, a backup. It's giving a black start capability. And I'll bet during that recent a winter storm in Oklahoma when we were hanging by an edge. We'd have loved to have had anybody that had any form of a black start or backup system to help us out. Now, I do understand that this is designed with islanding. So if there's a terrorist attack and all over Kingdom Come or all over the Oklahoma uh, we're out of power, that Fort Sill is going to use those facilities for Fort Sill first, but it's going to help to have them even connected to the grid and to be a backup. Maybe a better way to say it is, I don't think it's fair to cost to look at the cost of peaking unit electricity with the cost of base load electricity. And I'm not saying that that's what's been done in every sense, but it bothers me that the uh, at Attorney General's office would say that, uh, well, we're not counting the black start uh, as an advantage. You're getting, you're getting uh, something for it. And uh, Commissioner Hyatt, we did get the parties clarify that um, although um, 100 million plus of the cost of the unit is going to PSO and the ratepayers, that that. $10 million was earmarked to be paid by the Defense Department. And Commissioner Murphy and I both had part of that discussion uh, during the, the hearing. So it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult to know the exact nature of this proposal. But part of the proposal is that you've got the company, the electric power utility, and the Department of Defense working together to try and find a proposal that has mutual uh, benefits. And uh, I guess I would leave us with the thought, if you read the statute, uh, 286C, it talks about the word cost. And I'm not so sure that it says you have to resolve all of the cost issue in this case. PSO's got a rate case going on right now, I believe. We've got the winter storm case and we've got this other one. I think I recall that there have been uh, cases that we've had certain issues and we would roll over parts of the resolution to the big picture to a related case. Uh, I've, since you all are working on orders, I'm just giving you some uh, free things to think about. Maybe we got to get through the day. We've got to give them an answer. I hope the answer is we can approve this application. If there's, uh, and, I, and I, uh, I'll tell you, I agree with the Attorney General when he said that when you figure the interest for the calculation for the rider, that he, I think he said he would do the cost of debt. That is more conservative. That's more favorable to the ratepayers than saying the cost of capital, which is a blended average, or the return on the equity. That would be a higher deal. But I'm not so sure that we couldn't uh, come to that, as the application says, when you uh, uh, hope eventually to roll it into uh, rate base. All right, you all are very patient. If you uh, needed some uh, input for your drafting of proposed orders. Uh, there's a little bit. I didn't have to write it down. Well, thank you. I don't uh, disagree with many of your points. I doubt anyone in here disagrees with many of your points. And I, uh, the security of the uh, 
of the facility on the base and the resi resiliency of power supply was all discussed extensively in the testimony and there's certainly a lot of logic in it and I think that's the reason it's even more incumbent upon us to make sure that we get this right and right. make sure that we issue an order that can uh, that does conform to the statute. All right, you make me think of one other thing. Oh goodness! Can anybody <laughs> to to take the air defense artillery, the entire uh, operation with close to ten thousand active soldiers and the uh, whatever the size is? And that just showed up at Fort Sill. Uh, did somebody come and say, hey, uh, we need to send them a thank you note. They're going to use a lot of electricity, and they're going to be helping to pay the fixed cost and the uh, capital in investment. Uh, it, that's a big customer. That's a nice thing. I think this is the problem with piecemeal rate making, too. Uh, people are, are zeroing in on this uh, aspect of a of a a narrowly defined proposal. Uh, if you look at the the big picture and uh, the close to 80,000 people that have military, whether it's retired or whether it's families or whether it's active or whether it's the, the people in training, um, I'm not so sure that um, a close analysis uh, has been done with some of the cost uh, uh, testimony that was given at least in a couple of parts. Thank you. Like Commissioner Hyatt, I also appreciate some of the comments you've made. I would note that the $10 million the military is providing, it has to do more with the land and where the facility is going to be built. It's not a straight $10 million going into the $118 million. And I really appreciate your comments about insurance, but the thing is you pay for the insurance and the insurance is for you. My mom has a backup generator and the Nobody paid for that, and her neighbors come down when their power goes out, but she doesn't ask them to pay for part of the cost of coming down and being at her house because she has power and they don't. So um, I appreciate the analogies. I, I just think there's some other components of it, but I do agree that I, I think it behooves us to, to do our best to spend a little more time and try to get it right, and I'm very thoughtful about the 240 days. Yeah, I think you know, Commissioner Anthony, I really want to try to follow the statutes, but it's not like the utility is going to put in interim rates like we've got on some of the other issues, and I do appreciate, Mr. Fight, that you gave us those, those dates. That was helpful to know that information, so thank you. All right. I think that can look, concludes that agenda item. And uh, with that, so will there be any new business to come before the meeting? So when is our ne next scheduled meeting? Monday at 1.30. Monday at 1.30. Yes, sir. So do we anticipate that this would be posted for additional consideration at that time? I think. Right. And I'm, I would be asking for that. Thank you. All right. Will there be any new business? Seeing none, meeting is adjourned. about to terminate.